Everybody can hear me? Good. Because I'm, uh, I have a bit of a problem with my, with my breath. So I'll try to enunciate and be clear. Uh, it's a great honor, and I want to thank the uh, Museo Thyssen uh, for inviting me. Uh, this was not only an honor, but it is a way for me to visit and return to my years at the Villa Favorita, which were, no question, probably the best years, certainly professionally, of my life. It was an enormous uh, uh, privilege uh, to be involved. Uh, I started there in 1964 as a visiting conservator. In other words, I was going back and forth between Lugano and my private practice that I had already in Florence. So I never was, let's say, uh, an employee full-time of the collection, but I spent about half of the time there from the early 1960s, from 1964, until the collection moved to Madrid. Uh, so it was a long run, and uh, I, uh, I had an extraordinary uh, experience, uh, professionally and personally, because in those years, I uh, was able to interact uh, with the Baron, uh, with his friends, uh, with his consorts, uh, the plural, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and altogether, uh, I was able also, which was a tremendous privilege, to be able to be involved in the acquisition of some of the collection's greatest, not perhaps greatest, but certainly very notable masterpieces. It was uh, the last moment, really, uh, that you could still uh, obtain things of great significance. And, uh, and that uh, Heine understood, and he certainly rose to the challenge when the moment came. Uh, uh, the, uh, my story uh, begins in Florence uh, with my family's business, which was in the arts. My grandfather was a quite a prof uh, pro uh, prominent art dealer. And that continued uh, with my father, who was rather less successful, but anyway, taught me to love things uh, that he grew up with. And so my interests always were with the earlier things of Italian art, the Trecento, Quattrocento. Uh, then uh, I, I had a long spell in America because my mother was American. So I did my studies there, military service, etc. And then in 1956, 57, I returned to Italy. I was very nostalgic of my childhood in Florence, and, uh, and then began uh, about a year and a half, almost two years, of apprenticeship at the Uffizi, at the Gabinetto del Restauro. Uh, we used to work in the morning uh, at the Gabinetto del Restauro, at the Uffizi, and then in the afternoon, we would go to the Accademia, where there was a small studio, run by this uh, wonderful old kind of uh, crazy man uh, who was the scientific sort of a guru of the Uffizi at the time. He knew everything about x-rays, ultraviolets, and nothing about paintings. And as you can see, they did not give him uh, the best works. So, but, I, you know, it was great. I was young, learned a lot became very good friends with a German chap called Schneider, Tommaso Schneider, who then uh, loved Italy so much in his first years there that he then came back after working in Stuttgart and uh, worked with me as a partner in my private studio in Florence uh, for another six or seven years. Um, my uh, connection uh, with Heine, my meeting 
with Heine, uh, began, excuse me, uh, can I go back? I'm so sorry. Oh, no, fine. All right. My meeting with Heine began when uh, uh, he had met uh, a young lady in Florence, a German woman, uh, very, very attractive and very nice, and uh, he started coming to visit Florence in his little Queen Air at the time. He, there were no private jets. And so he would come to Florence, and then uh, naturally I knew this young lady because her parents were good friends of my parents. And one day she called me and she said, uh, I would like to come by the studio uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, the gossip in Florence was such that I knew already who the friend was. Uh, so I put on my Sunday best and greeted them uh, when they came to my studio. This would have been in 1964. Um, uh, Heine had a bag with him, uh, which he deposited on my work table. And out of the bag came, came uh, not this bust, painted bust, uh, uh, which is, of course, a howling forgery, uh, but another one, even worse. And so I looked at it, and of course, I didn't want to be a smart aleck and say, oh my goodness, get it out of here. Uh, I said, well, I'll study it, you know, I'll very earnestly. So he left it there, which was great, because then I was able to do a very elaborate study uh, of this sort of scientific, as it were, and then uh, sent it on to him. Uh, the next time he came to Florence, uh, we had dinner, he invited me uh, with the lady. We went to Harry's bar, and there he said, would you come to Lugano to be my conservator? And of course, uh, I was speechless, and uh, uh, I, I couldn't. I, I said, well, you know, uh, I still have a private practice. I have to really think about it. I try to make it difficult. Uh, and then, of course, naturally, uh, consulted with my father, who was a very wise man, and he said, don't take it. What do you mean, don't take it? I mean, this is the greatest opportunity anyone could ever have. And he said, no. He said, you must not never become totally attached to a very powerful and rich person because they can pick you up and throw you out just as easily. And I said, well, I guess that's OK. He said, make him a proposition that you will go there on a part-time basis only, and then divide your time with your private practice, which is very important to you, which, of course, it wasn't, because I wasn't really doing very much in Florence. He told Vince he accepted the offer, which was fantastic. And, uh, and that's when I started spending time in Lugano. And at the time, uh, the gallery, of course, had been all set up and so forth, but there was no one there, really, except a caretaker who was a light, nice Hungarian man who had been, I think, in charge of the Baron's stables in, uh, uh, in uh, Rohonks, I mean, in Hungary. So he was definitely not an art uh, connoisseur, but he was a very diligent man, took care of the gallery. Uh, very few people came at the time. It was open on, already to the public, but uh, there was only a smattering of visitors. And so that's when I started my life uh, as the visiting conservator to the gallery. The other photograph in, uh, in the slide is interesting because that's the real thing. And it turns out that it had belonged to my grandfather that then went to a Dutch collector uh, in the 30s or in the 20s maybe still, and then surfaced again from the uh, grandson of that collector uh, and the photograph was sent to me because I guess he had heard that there was a Grassi in the Thyssen collection involved. So one day I got this photograph. Of course, I recognized it from the archives of our family. My father was still alive, and he told me this wonderful story about this fantastic 
bust that everybody at the time thought was a fake like the other one. It is not a fake because by then already TL testing had been developed, so uh, that checked out and then Olga Rajo, who was a conservator of culture at the Met, identified it as a really a masterpiece by Gian Cristoforo Romano. Uh, so uh, putting that really as a contrast, but the bust comes somewhat later in the story. Uh, the story actually begins in my studio in 1964, when on the work table I had a figure of a deposed Christ in wood and polychrome which had been uh, taken out of a church. In 1961, the Vatican Council had completely revised the uh, Catholic liturgy, eliminating uh, all, um, let's say, secondary objects that were involved with the liturgy. As a result, in 1961 and the early 60s, there was a huge uh, outpouring from the churches of material. The piece that you see was one of them, and it was uh, snapped up by a young uh, uh, dealer in Florence who understood the importance. The thing was uh, in wretched condition. It had six coats of overpaint uh, and uh, had been very badly mishandled over the years. Uh, but uh, I, he sent it to me, and uh, over several months, I very diligently removed the uh, overpaints, which was not an easy task, and out came the most incredibly preserved uh, polychromy uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, uh, be, you have to imagine that this piece dates from about 1260, so it's a 13th century object uh, that has incredible conservation. And the perizoma, the cloth, still had, although it was uh, oxidized, its original silver uh, gilding or silver silvering. Uh, so uh, it is a spectacular uh, object. Uh, Tyson, on, my, on his first visit to the studio, looked at it in a rather bleak condition, but understood. And I explained to him how interesting this was, and he immediately decided to purchase it. So in a way, it was my first uh, contribution to the collection. Uh, and, uh, and then we kind of were rather naughty in getting it out of Italy, but that's another story. Uh, hang on. Nothing's happening. I'm so sorry. Uh, I beg your pardon. Somebody has to come and help. Ah, okay. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, all right, well, I think we've all seen this. I, I'm just bringing it up simply to show you a little bit the topography of what I found when I came to the Villa Favorita. Uh, on the right is the actual villa itself, and then on the left are the other structures along the lake. Uh, there was the so-called Glorietta, which is that rather larger building, and then on the other side is a smaller house, and then in between you can just see the roof line of the gallery. It is an absolutely, or was, an absolutely incredible setting. Uh, and then in order to get there, you had to walk about a kilometer in this beautiful uh, cypress line driveway. Uh, magnificent. Um, um, by 1966, of course, I was already the visiting conservator. And in 1966, Florence was hit with a catastrophic flood. Uh, so I... Uh, that was in Lugano, actually, at the time. Uh, it was the 6th of November. The caretaker came, a uh, very nice man, who was uh, just really the janitor in a way. Uh, 
Uh, and he said, oh, Mr. Grass, you're from Florence, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, I just heard on the radio that the water has reached this first floor of Palazzo Pitti. I said, that's impossible. That would be, half of Europe would be underwater. Uh, but I knew, I understood that there was something going on. So I turned on the radio, realized the disaster, got in my car, and took me 12 hours to get to Florence, which normally would take about four and a half. Got there and uh, contacted my old colleagues from the Uffizi, with whom I had studied, but by now, in a way, I was a colleague uh, instead of an apprentice. And so they put me to work on this gigantic Last Supper by Vasari that had been uh, in Santa Croce, in the museum at Santa Croce. The museum of Santa Croce, of course, is also where the single biggest loss occurred of the flood, which was a crucifix by Cimabue, which was a disaster. I did not get to work on that. Uh, I got to work on the rather, rather less interesting Vasari, but it was a moment that I, how can you forget? It's like the fog of war. I, I don't remember how many days I was there. I don't remember who was there. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, I think you can see Thomas there. He gave me a hand as well. We were, what we were doing is putting uh, protective papers onto the surface of the picture because everyone knew that when the panel dried, the color, the panel would shrink, there would be no room for the color, and the color would fall off. So you'd have to conserve it with, uh, uh, with paper on top, uh, glued on top, uh, for other reasons that are too complicated. Uh, I can tell you that that was not the best decision, but that wasn't unfortunate, or fortunately, wasn't my decision. Um, right, well, now we come to uh, the main event because, as I say, I'm very proud that over the years, uh, via some contacts, via friends, via uh, people that I knew, uh, uh, I was able to be uh, aware of some works of art of very great significance. The greatest, I think, uh, at least for my taste, is this fantastic crucifixion, which is a fragment. In other words, it has obviously lost its frame. It has obviously lost the bottom because it probably was in a place where water got to it. So at a certain point in the 19th century, they simply cut the back, the bottom off which sometimes they would do, but what was left is fantastically sublime in terms of conservation. It is probably one of the greatest Sienese pictures in the world. And, uh, and if you can analyze this only from the point of view of the composition and, and uh, observe, I don't know whether you can see them clearly enough, uh, the angels, the way they express their despair in different ways and different moves, uh, and then the way that the heads move. And uh, it is, uh, as I say, the kind of work of art that encompasses everything that you ever can hope to see in a period and in a moment of art. And of course, Siena in the 14th century was a very good place for art, uh, starting with Duccio and then uh, going on to a lesser artist. But this, he worked uh, closely with Duccio, uh, was a contemporary. Uh, and, uh, and this particular picture, after it went to the Favorita, uh, it was identified as having been on the main altar in the church of Car the Carmine in Florence, and therefore may have influenced uh, Sienese, uh, let's say, style on Florentine painting at the same time. On the right is a picture that um, obviously Heine couldn't resist because it's so wonderfully erotic, and, uh, and clearly that was definitely an e easy sell. And it's a precious uh, work on copper by a very rare artist who is a contemporary of Caravaggio, uh, even though he's not affected by Caravaggio,
but they knew each other almost certainly in Rome at the very beginning of the 17th century. Uh, the other uh, thing, a picture, great masterpiece that I am very, very proud of having been involved in is a few steps away from here. Uh, this picture uh, was part of a, a collection of a man called Riva in Milan. He was a very good textile uh, 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 entrepreneur and had bought a palace in Milan, a uh, rather grand palace in Milan, and wanted to refurbish it. And uh, in order to do that, <clears throat> he had been told that the old Scalchi in Rome had a, uh, next to their palace in Santi Apostoli, uh, had a fencing room where they used to, kids used to fence. And in that fencing room was this uh, five meter or something like that, certainly about 15 feet long uh, picture. And then when the Odiskaki sold the palace, they rolled up the picture and uh, left it there until Mr. Riva heard about it and bought it for his palace in Milan. Uh, between buying it and putting it up, he went bankrupt. So the thing was in a judicial kind of uh, limbo uh, when we heard about it. And uh, I remember, uh, uh, I remember uh, bringing it to New York. At that time, I was already spending time in New York. We had to rent a room in an abandoned school in order to get it in. It was so big. We hoisted it up uh, from the street with a crane, put it down. I was able to, of course, uh, do what ne necessary. The most important thing was lining it. In other words, it had been rolled up, so it was very fragile and, uh, and needed to be stretched on a proper stretcher. So <clears throat> that was done. While it was done, or as it was being done, Heine was visiting New York, said, what are you doing? I said, ah, I'm working on this interesting project. And he instantly bought it. And of course, now it is one of the great masterpieces of the collection. So uh, uh, there are other items in the collection which are also interesting because of their provenance. And one of them is the Duccio uh, Formella. It's really not a predella. It's really like a scene. And it comes from the most important pictorial work of the Italian medieval period, which is the Maestà of Duccio. The Maestà is a gigantic picture that was uh, commissioned to Duccio in 1310 uh, to commemorate a famous uh, battle that uh, Sienese had won against the Florentines uh, about 100 years earlier. It's the only battle that they ever won, so they were very proud of it because they began losing them after that, uh, eventually becoming part of the Florentine uh, state. But the Maesta <coughs> was a huge painting. It had a central part with the Madonna and child surrounded by an infinite number of saints and apostles, blah, blah, blah. And then in the back, it had scenes uh, commemorating the whole Christological cycle. So it was, in a way, a kind of symphony of Christian belief it tr translated into beautiful, beautiful images. Uh, the Maista had a bad history. In the 18th century, it was moved from one altar, from the main altar of the Sienese Cathedral to a side altar, and then a little bit later in the 18th century, it was moved to another church outside of the, anyway, finally it was broken up and uh, sawn to pieces. The whole framework was went, uh, they sawed it in half because it was painted on both sides, so that was a tragic uh, disaster. But pieces of it uh, have uh, survived. Uh, thank goodness the main piece, uh, <clears throat> the main front piece, does still exist in Siena, 
And that is the first picture that I saw when I started as a student at the Istituto Centrale del Restauro in Rome in, 19, in 1957. Um, so that was my first. And then, uh, and then um, much, much later, uh, uh, I remember one evening uh, going in to Heine's office. We were both bachelors at the time, and I was living in the back in a guest room. And I, this photograph is very touching because I had never seen it before. But this is typical of how Heine spent his evenings at the Villa Favorita if he didn't have guests or other more important things to do. He would sit at the desk and then phone, look at his papers and so forth. And then <coughs> occasionally he would call up to the guest house and say, Go, uh, come to dinner. So, so it was a wonderful kind of um, uh, rapport that I had um, with, uh, with him in these sort of very uh, special moments. So this is a photograph that's very touching. At all events, one evening I was there and he showed me two photographs of, the, of this Formella and another one uh, of the raising of Lazarus. And he said, well, what do you think? He said, I can't afford both, but uh, I'd like to buy one, I, I should say. Uh, well, anyway, one, the other one was the raising of Lazarus. So I said, uh-uh, that's not a very good subject. You have a kind of a mummified creature on one side. I said, this is the one. So um, he made a deal with a, <laughs> with a lady uh, who had been, uh, Nelson Rockefeller was the governor of New York, and he had had a liaison, or uh, was having a liaison, with a beautiful woman who was the daughter of a famous uh, porcelain dealer uh, in London on Bond Street. And so uh, uh, Nelson uh, died in flagrante delicto uh, in the lady's arms and, and uh, must have bequeathed to her before dying the two Pridella panels that had belonged to John Dee, his father who was not a collector, but had these extraordinary relics from the Maista in you know. So uh, uh, Mr. Weinberg, the porcelain dealer, was uh, selling these, or the daughter, whoever, and uh, uh, clearly Heine decided to purchase uh, the Samaritan woman. And, uh, and then, of course, he made the deal over the phone, practically, while I was there. And, uh, and he said, well, if you're going up, I was going up at the time to look at stuff at the sales. <coughs> they go up and pick it up. So I, next time I was in London, it was stopped at Bond Street at the Antique Porcelain Company. And there it was in a little package. And uh, so I was, I was staying at a club on, uh, so I walked in uh, London, uh, quite a nice distance, with a piece of the Maista uh, under my arm. And I think that is probably the most memorable uh, walk that I've ever had in my life. Unforgettable moment when I had it. And then I put it in my hotel room and look at it. Fantastic. These are the things that are unforgettable and absolutely priceless. Another uh, great masterpiece that has a rather important name attached to it is the uh, fantastic little uh, Petrus Christus, the Madonna of the Rose Hung, uh, with the little uh, letters of the fraternity uh, dedicated, religious fraternity of Bruges, that was dedicated to the Madonna. It's only that big. And it is the only painting, uh, practically, uh, the only work of art that uh, Heine's uncle, Fritz Thyssen, owned. Uh, Fritz died, I think, in 1951, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and his widow, of course, survived. His widow is the benefactress of the Thyssen Stiftung, 
Uh, in other words, the colossal fortune that she inherited because they only had one daughter. Uh, the bulk of the fortune was into the Tissen Foundation. Uh, so it's that part of the family that is involved with the, and it is still the largest philanthropic uh, foundation in Germany. It's like the F Ford Foundation in America. Anyway, this painting uh, was, belonged to Fritz. It was next to his bed, and he obviously loved it, and so did his widow. Uh, because of the Stiftung uh, benefaction, it was decided uh, that the German government should give the lady uh, Malia Thyssen a honor, honorific title. <clears throat> so, she was rather old, and uh, uh, she, clearly she, she couldn't come to Bonn, so the chancellor decided, I think with already something in mind, to come to her. Uh, and uh, so he turned up in his helicopter, and then there was a function there where he gave her the collar or whatever, and she was by then quite old and totally overcome with, uh, with emotion. Uh, for her, Chancellor was a kind of a, uh, a god, and uh, so she was overcome with emotion. And she said, uh, Your Excellency, can I give you a souvenir of this visit, which for me is so important. And of course, he knew exactly what the souvenir would be. So he said, well, actually, uh, I, you know, there's a little picture. Ah, he said, so she asked a butler to go fetch it. I think the butler was already realizing what was happening, and he kind of hesitated. And then, apparently, so Heine always said, the chancellor said, no, no, go get it. <laughs> so out comes the Petrus Christus into the pocket of the chancellor, and off it goes. The next day, practically, the chancellor calls a man called Heinz Kistus, who was a sort of a macher and a kind of a brasseur d'affaires in Germany, and says, look, I think I'd like to sell this picture. <laughs> he said, but the only person that you can't offer it to is Heine Thyssen. Absolutely zero, not. Of course, what did Kisters do? Next day, he called Heine and said, uh, would you be interested in the uh, Petrus Christus? Uh, of course, he was interested. And the next day, the picture, the next couple of days, the picture arrived in Lugano. What's kind of interesting and amusing is that uh, in his retirement, Adnauer used to um, summer or spend time in La Lago Maggiore in, uh, what was the name of the place, Chernobyl. Anyway, he had a villa there, or stayed there, and uh, one day, uh, when I was there, uh, we got a call, and the call was that the chancellor would like to visit the Villa Favorita, of course. So, in he came with uh, some people, and I, I remember watching him closely when we went into the little room with the, uh, Petrus Christus hanging in the middle of the wall, and uh, the man's was, he had a face like a mask, and the mask absolutely uh, was immovable. It was amazing, the, uh, the nerve. Uh, the other picture, which I must say, I was quite interested in making sure that Heine would get, is this fantastic uh, example of German uh, expressionist art. And uh, it turned up in New York with a man called Richard Feigen, who we'll hear a little bit more about. Anyway, Richard, I knew very well. I worked with him. Uh, I did a lot of conservation work for him. He was really one of the prominent uh, gallerists in New York. He was the first American dealer to show German expressionists. He was a great fan of Beckman and uh, was the first to show Beckman. Uh, a great dealer who only died about a year and a half ago. Uh, one day, uh, he called me to the gallery, and he wanted to see 
how this picture, it was very fragile if it needed any work. <coughs> I was bowled over by it, and, um, and he was, he said, you know, Richard was a little bit of a, kind of a, a little bit of a name dropper. Anyway, he said, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to show this to Ronnie Lauder, he's the richest man in America, blah, blah, blah. And <coughs> I said, well, well, look, could you give me 24 hours with this picture? Because I think maybe Heine might be interested. Uh, and then he said, he knew of Heine, of course. And I said, no, nah. you know, give me 24 hours. I remember calling Heine. And uh, uh, anyway, the deal was done instantly. And I'm very proud because it really is a fantastic, fantastic thing. And uh, it kind of really opens uh, the German Expressionist field, which Heine got involved in quite early, certainly the, one of the first collectors to get involved. And the collection is, I think, probably the greatest <coughs> thing. Uh, okay, there's Richard. Uh, these are some of the people who were involved and uh, that I knew and that, of course, Heine knew and that uh, uh, I, I'm, I remember very fondly. Uh, they're no longer with us, uh, Richard, only recently. And uh, 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 Norbert Ketterer was the great dealer of German Expressionists, uh, the first great dealer of German Expressionists. Uh, he ran an auction house, but before that, he actually handled some of the estates of the <coughs> German expression. Uh, he had, it turns out, a lovely house in um, Campione, which is right across the lake from the Favorita. So he became quite involved uh, with, with Heine. And then on the right <coughs> is a man that I knew very well. Uh, a little man, only about five feet two, very smart, uh, very enterprising. He was a dealer, uh, I think native of Como actually, but then he also retreated to the Lake of Lugano for tax reasons. And uh, there uh, he became a magnet for a lot of Italian runners <coughs> who would bring him interesting material and uh, Silvano asked no questions. He paid them on the spot, and uh, uh, that's something that almost no one in Italy did. And so, because of that, they knew that they could bring stuff to Silvano and, uh, and, uh, and you know, and, and be satisfied. So, uh, in, the, in the space of a few years, um, his connection with Heine brought to the collection uh, a number of uh, wonderful things. Uh, you saw the Carlo Saraceni already, the little Venus and Mars, but maybe the most extraordinary is a tondo by Biccafumi. Biccafumi is an amazing artist, and the tondo is maybe his greatest masterpiece on panel. He did some frescoes in uh, Siena, which are fantastic as well. But uh, he is a very, very rare artist considered. And, uh, and that is, I think, if you focus on it when you visit the gallery, uh, you will see what an exception. And then it is in fabulous condition, uh, fantastic condition, uh, really a magnificent object. Uh, one, two, three. Ah, uh, well, these are just examples of, uh, that you all know, or that you will know, if you go out into the gallery, of uh, areas where Heine was really a supreme collector. Uh, uh, Max Beckman is probably one of his greatest portraits. And then the Homer, I mean, the fact that this picture is in Spain would make an American go nuts because Homer is probably the greatest uh, artist, American artist, uh, considered certainly one of the greatest American artists who ever lived. The sea pieces are three. There's one in the Met, 
I think there's one in Los Angeles, and then there's this one, but this is the greatest. So, uh, uh, this is uh, an amazing, an amazing object. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's a kind of an icon of American painting because it's heroic, it shows the American spirit of adventure and enterprise. These are whalers that would go out into the North Sea, risk their lives, come back with the whales uh, to make the oil, and, uh, and there was something, of course, uh, heroic about them, and if you know the uh, Conrad's uh, novels and so forth, they speak about this phase of American, of American life. Uh, of course, at this moment, and Simon is here, and he will tell you about it, uh, the collection uh, uh, became public. Uh, the public it was already, but it became sensationally public when the Russian pictures from the Hermitage arrived. Uh, that was by virtue of Heine's visits to the Soviet Union, on the fact that Piotrovsky, the director of the Soviet of the Hermitage, was anxious to have uh, a relationship with the West. Uh, uh, Switzerland was neutral, so there was no political danger. Uh, it was a fantastic event. Uh, the lines uh, went on right down to the town for kilometers. Uh, it was in every paper in the world. Uh, it was a tremendous, tremendous uh, event. And all of a sudden, overnight, the Villa Favorita, from a rather private uh, enclave, became the center of the arts universe. And uh, as I say, uh, Simon is definitely uh, 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 responsible for then doing that and then continuing uh, a series of fantastic historical uh, exhibitions. In uh, uh, These are some of the uh, people that I remember well and that with whom I became involved. Uh, on the left is a nice photograph and a fest shrift uh, that I uh, uh, helped to organize. Uh, and uh, I think Maria de Peverelli is, I think, is involved. Anyway, we um, uh, felt that he died very prematurely in 19, in 2000. And, um, and he was a brilliant restorer who came to the Favorita in a sense to replace me at the time when it was clear that with all of the international exhibition back and forth, uh, it needed really a full-time rather than a part-time visiting conservator. So he became the, really the, the person uh, in charge of conservation in Lugano and uh, had that post for a number of years. We became friends. It could have been, could have been, you know, uh, restorers are worse than uh, singers. They don't like each other too much. Uh, they like to criticize each other and so forth. But uh, I had tremendous uh, respect. It was a touchy beginning, but it got on. We became friends, and he came to visit us in Florence uh, uh, just a year before he died, and I remember him extremely with great fondness. On the right is one of the rare photographs of Rudy Heinemann. Heinemann was clearly not very photogenic, uh, to say the least, uh, and uh, uh, so he didn't like to be photographed, and uh, this was taken uh, the Christina is in the foreground. Uh, I'm there, uh, looking a lot younger, actually. Uh, and on the terrace of uh, Rudy's villa, looking down on the Favorita. So it had a kind of a symbolic placement because he wanted to keep his bits on the, on the spot. And uh, he and his wife uh, would spend summers there and definitely uh, were in control. Uh, of course, they would come to dinner often to the Favorita, and uh, one time, a priceless evening, uh, uh, they had their Mercedes in, the, in front of the villa, and while we were having dinner, Heine called Giorgio the butler over and said, uh, put, the, 
put uh, there's a downstairs there was a kind of a neoclassic or something uh, like a head of a s sculpture that had no body so it was there sitting around on the ground floor and they put that in in uh, Mr. Heinemann's car so <laughs> put it in the trunk and then Rudy and his wife as they were going out there was a gate and the gate uh, was closed and the very nice lady at the gate said uh, Dr. Heinemann uh, uh, we had a couple of problems uh, you don't mind if you open your trunk oh he said of course not so <laughs> open the trunk <laughs> anyway that was we were able to give Rudy maybe two minutes of discomfort uh, and uh, Ah, right. Well, uh, as, as you probably know, uh, uh, Honey had a very, very beautiful uh, spot in Jamaica uh, called Indian Head. It was a magical um, spot near a beautiful little beach called Sun Sun Beach. It was all of, it was like a Caribbean dream. And he would go there, and once he invited Christina and me to spend a few days there, which we did, and <clears throat> they were unforgettable. Heine was in great form. Uh, that's him on the dock of Alligator Head, and I love that photograph. And I love this photograph because I also took this at an opening. I honestly <clears throat> don't remember, but uh, obviously, uh, well, Tita was beautiful, and Tiny is radiant. Uh, it was in an opening of something at the Favorita. He was obviously very happy. This is how I really remember him, as an elegant in his Caraceni uh, you know, blazer, uh, beautifully turned out, uh, and charming, smiling, uh, and, uh, and, and of course, um, uh, my... Uh, uh, my friend. Uh, so I remember you, Heine, uh, with great affection. And uh, wherever you are, uh, God bless you. I think you're probably in collector's heaven. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> no questions. Okay, let's go have some lunch. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was taking somebody around the collection um, just this week, and they commented on the quality uh, of the restoration of all the paintings. And I, I seem to remember very much that he was very keen to uncover the initial and the original colors of all the Renaissance paintings, which back in those days were very often covered by this coat of rather tarnished varnish that was sort of, and we had all grown up looking at paintings uh, and chapels with that kind of obscure color on them. And it, it shocked people tremendously at the time when the first of these works started being uncovered and these Renaissance colors seemed suddenly very vulgar or, or, or bright. And there was a huge controversy about this at the time that, as I understood, maybe you could say a few words about how um, he was quite pioneering in that respect of 
inviting his conservators to reveal the original um, colors of works, which was slightly controversial at the time. Could you elaborate on that, please? Um, I, I would say this, that the great majority of the paintings uh, that were, uh, uh, came into the collection starting in the, in the 1930s uh, with Baron Heinrich and then continued on after the war by uh, Heine, uh, came mostly through very, let's say, established channels, uh, many, 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 via Rudolf Heinemann. Uh, there's no question that he was responsible for the lion's share of the great paintings that came in, starting with the uh, Tornaboni portrait. I mean, uh, the, he was in America and uh, was in between Germany and America. He was definitely uh, the, the guy who uh, handled uh, those uh, uh, transactions. Uh, uh, he was uh, 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 in the, let's say, the, the, the most respected conservator at the time, uh, uh, private conservator. He wasn't really private because he was working for the Frick. His name was uh, William Sewer. He was a German who had come to America uh, actually as an actor and then realized that he had a talent for painting and for restoring. And so he made a career, a very brilliant career, in New York uh, at the Frick and working privately. Uh, so uh, uh, many, many, many of the paintings that came via uh, Rudolf and maybe via other dealers, uh, both in London and New York, had been worked on by, by uh, uh, Seur, including the Duccio uh, and, the, you know, uh, all of the, let's say, early purchases. Now, Seur was uh, uh, reflected, in a way, the uh, uh, philosophy at the time uh, that uh, paintings had to uh, be uh, very, very sort of, how do you say, uh, uh, brightly presented. Uh, uh, if the picture was curved because it was a panel, which was a natural thing for panels to do, they would try to straighten them because pictures had to be straight. Uh, they often would actually take the original panel off and put the painting on a kind of a plyboard, uh, which of course would remain flat forever. So <clears throat> the Duccio, for instance, is one of those. Uh, today, that would be unthinkable to remove an, an original panel. Uh, so uh, not only structurally uh, were the pictures uh, energetically worked on, they were also energetically worked on in the removal of whatever blemishes there might be. Uh, Billy Soar was also a very talented painter and, and restorer, and so uh, the pictures are very often <coughs> retouched very carefully and very skillfully. Uh, another restorer who for a time worked on the Italian pictures was Mario Modestini. Mario was a friend of mine, and uh, well, I knew Billy Sewer also, but Mario, because Italian, Roman, etc. And anyway, uh, but Mario was definitely a very, very uh, thorough restorer. In other words, everything came beautifully, sort of, you know, uh, finished and uh, uh, intact, as it were. That is a, a uh, uh, that is a practice that today is no longer uh, in uh, in uh, in use. I mean, uh, uh, ask any practicing conservator today about 
uh, retouching and restoring, they will tell you that the less you do, the better it is. So, uh, and the beginning of that, actually, uh, I was able to be involved with at the beginning because the inventor, or at least the theorist behind that, is a man called Cesare Brandi, who was the head of the institute where I was studying in the 50s in Rome. And Brandi was not a restorer, but he was a theorist of restoration. And he developed a very elaborate way of, for instance, uh, in painting, uh, touching painting, so that you could see uh, the missing areas, but then they would blend in with the image and so forth. But of course, conservation is not an exact science, no matter what people tell you. And, uh, and it isn't. Uh, so a, p a painting is a little bit like a piece of music, which can be interpreted in any number of, can be read in any number of ways, uh, subjectively, uh, and then worked on in many different ways. There's no, let's say, perfect way. <clears throat> the only thing is that if you perform badly a piece of music, that still survives as a piece of music. It doesn't happen with a painting. Once you've ruined it or once you've made a mistake, that mistake, it stays forever. So we have, uh, you know, have a rather difficult time uh, uh, carrying that responsibility, sometimes not very well. I, I seem to remember traveling with my father to, to Florence several times over the years um, and also to the Vatican. I did, did, you engaged him in a lot of public conservation projects in the chapel of Tornamboni, I believe, or did, did he not contribute through your auspices to a number of conservation projects of, of in the Vatican or in, in other places in Florence? Uh. You Did you understand? What? I'm sorry. Ah, sorry, Marco. I, sorry, I'm, I'm not speaking I, into I'm the not, mic. I'm, not, um, I'm deaf, actually. That's oh. the problem. <laughs> no, about the cons the public um, venues that he contributed to the conservation of. Did you sort of hold his hand during these processes and interest in get his interest into also restoring public venues such as chapels in in Rome and in in Florence? Did you accompany him on those journeys? Was I involved with that? Yeah. Uh, not really. Um, I'll tell you why. Because until quite recently, uh, the Italian governance in the, way, in the area of the arts was very, very strictly in the hands of the government. In other words, uh, whatever was church or <coughs> in museums, was very tightly controlled by uh, the Soprangenerenza of Florence or Rome or whatever. And uh, very little work uh, could be done outside of their control. Uh, that has now changed dramatically. So there are, um, uh, let's say, very, very, uh, and that's, that's a good thing because, let's say, certain conservators uh, like to think that they are specialists in one field, and that's pretty much correct. In other words, there are some colleagues of mine who are particularly gifted in working on 19th century works. Uh, I like to think that I am rather more in the early part of the scheme. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the intelligent thing uh, is if you have a very wide variety of things that need to be conserved, is to try to choose uh, people who have very particular expertise in those fields. Now, uh, that now is beginning to happen in Italy. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, concern in America is that, uh, that there are many, many museums of course, hundreds, thousands of museums. 
and it is now considered a uh, necessity for a museum, no matter how small and how, in a way, unimportant, uh, to have an in-house conservator. Now, uh, the Metropolitan can pretend to have the best in the world in each field, and they do, by and large. Uh, the man who does sculpture is brilliant. The man who does painting, I know very well, brilliant. But, uh, you know, in Topeka, Kansas, that has a museum, and might actually have two or three very good paintings, those pictures go in the hands of somebody who is, was hired by the Topeka, Kansas Museum, and maybe is not the greatest practitioner. So it used to be that people like Billy Sewer and Mario Modestini, in their private practice, would receive works from small museums. Uh, and uh, I think that was, and they were not the only ones. There were other people who did other kind of things, 19th century things, etc. cetera. Uh, um, and that was a good thing, I think. Uh, but that's not going to change. In other words, now uh, museums have to have their in-house conservators, uh, no matter what. But, uh, you know, uh, that's again open to, con to discussion, if you will. Did that answer your question or not? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Tell me. You're welcome, Francesca. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you all. <laughs>